I've been looking forward to this one for a while. Uh, he came to Louisiana as a North Dakota native in the early 70s, and he never left. 25 years as the LSU head basketball coach, 13 trips to the NCAA tournament, including two Final Fours and two other teams that made the Elite Eight. It is Daddy Dale Brown. Coach, how are you today? Chuck, I'm going to make it through another day, Doug. I feel good about I got my shots, so I'm ready to roll. So you're fully vaccinated? Fully vaccinated, both my wife and I, yeah. People listening to you right now, Coach, we could be doing an interview from 1986. You're going to be 86 years old this year, and you haven't... Oh, I know it. I, I know it. And you haven't and you haven't lost the thing. Well, look, a couple of things I want to speak to you about today. So, the last several years there was a came uh, a campaign, I guess you could say, for Dale Brown Court. Okay, people talking about should the court be named after the legendary LSU basketball coach. And I would consider Tim Brando a friend. He's never big time me before. He's always been very nice to me, helpful in my career. I would consider Jordy Collada a good friend. I, I love his passion. He's lived here his whole life. He, uh, he he loves LSU basketball. Dick Vitale, a big part of my youth and watching LSU basketball and watching your teams and watching Shaq. Uh, his great calls when he was enthusiastic. Is there anything that you would like to say on the whole issue of Dale Brown Court and what's been said back and forth about it? Um, this isn't trying to be modest or humble in any way at all, but I never ever in my entire life ever thought I would be the National Coach of the Year. I never ever thought, it was never a goal of mine to be in the College Basketball Hall of Fame. It certainly was never a goal of mine to have a statue or a court named after me or anything. But, um, and, and I'm not trying to belittle any of those things. Um, but it was, it was never a goal. It wasn't a passion. Like Rick Pitino, I remember, Rick wrote a book called Born to Coach. And his passion was to do what he did. I just wanted to coach and work with people. It wasn't some, something about what Dale Brown wanted to do or, or, or become. Now, as far as the court is concerned, it's very, very simple. And as far as anything is concerned, I was involved with Buddy Romer called me. They were trying to not name the arena after Pete Maravich. And he gave me a call, he was governor, and said, can you call these people and can you talk to them about your opinion about Pete Maravich? And not that I had anything to do with naming the, the building after him, but there was a group that didn't want to name it after him. So I think what you need on anything, you, what are the standards? And let me use this as an analogy. Chris Jackson, Mahmoud abdul Rauf, one of the nicest human beings God ever put on this earth, a, a beautiful person, one of the greatest players of all time. He still is the leading freshman scorer in the history of college basketball. They never would retire his jersey. I told you, you got you to speak to this committee. You got to speak to that committee. Well, what, what, what's the standards? Will you tell me what the standards are? Nobody ever gave me any standards. Well, you know, they just were... Well, I know what the standards were. They totally missed. He, he, he was one of the most devout Christians I've ever seen in my life. So that's what the court is. What are the standards? What are the standards to go into the Hall of Fame? What are the standards to have a, your, your flag, your, your flag, uncle? Um, there's got to be standards, and that's just a political thing. Mm -hmm. I've, somebody called me and told me that... Uh, well, you know what they're trying to do is try to get a million dollars off that court and name it after a business or something. Well, then get a million dollars. Um, yeah. So it, it's a. Uh, I love Louisiana. That's why we stayed here. I'm eternally grateful that I was given the chance and no one guy to be the coach here. And I love Baton Rouge and I love LSU, but I don't like the politics. And Mahmoud Abdul Roof would be an example of that. So when Dick Vitale goes on TV and campaigns for the court to be Dale Brown Court, you know, Coach, there's some people out there that think you guys are like text messaging back and forth or something, right? Like Dale Brown's telling uh, Dick Vitale well, to say they're delusional. <laughs> they're delusional. They're totally delusional. That's all i got to say. I don't uh, dislike Dick at all. I've had my run-ins with him about when, he, when we were in, making our runs at Dale Brown, they'll never get out of this game. They shouldn't have been in the NCAA tournament or whatever. But yeah. I have almost... No communication with Dick Vitale. And, you know, I want to comment also about the Dick Vitale thing. I think it's a total insult. And I've had a talk. Uh, I've had a talk with my wife who got more common sense than I'll ever have. 
but about that situation. And the jury has apologized for that. He went on the air and did it. But for him to say the rumors are swarming that Dale Brown is sabotaging the program and feeding Dick Vitale with information, there couldn't be a bigger lie. And that really, really was wrong. And I don't know if any local media picked that up and immediately corrected it because it couldn't have been a bigger lie. If I'm sabotaging something, I wouldn't have sent them a player from Croatia that I sent video on. Um, I wouldn't, if I was, if I was, I shouldn't even be talking about this because it's so preposterous. But do you think Shaquille O'Neal's son would be here if I didn't, if I was sabotaging the program? That's the last thing. I'm not that kind of person. Am I blunt? Do I talk too much? Am I curt maybe sometimes? Being blunt? Yes. But I'm certainly not a Benedict Arnold. I mean, I, I mean, just, that bugged me so bad. Uh, but that's yeah. given the Cordy Rush and the station owner and Jordi Collada have all apologized for it. And uh, it's history, and I, I have no bad feelings. But for even anybody, to, and I wonder if any media jumped on that. Did they jump on it and say, well, that was a cheap shot? That was, that was totally wrong. Uh, Coach, I think that was more of a uh, talk radio discussion than it was a, you know, on the local news at night television uh-huh. type thing, I think, you know. And, and and the rules are different, I think, than what we talk yeah. about and what they talk about. You know, we, we they're, they're having discussions and debates and whatnot, and I guess stuff like that comes up. In our case, we're more or less giving scores, highlights, and trying to jam as much as we can into three minutes to seven minutes, you know. So that's one of the things I wanted to kind of give you the opportunity to platform today to say, um, you know, I guess some people have wondered, is Dale Brown on board with Will Wade? Does he support Will Wade and the program and everything? I think you've kind of made that uh, somewhat clear. I, um, I would never do anything to hurt LSU. Yes. LSU is not an individual. LSU is a school that gave me a chance, and I'm eternally grateful. And if I can help LSU, and I have helped LSU in many ways, and I don't go blabbering all over what I did to help, but um, anyway, I understand. it's even silly. It's almost preposterous for me to be talking to you about this. It's, yeah. it's, it, it, it's degrading to even do this. I appreciate that. All right. So now, Coach, um, back in November 18th of 1985, Dale Brown was on the front cover of Sports Illustrated. Crazy days at LSU. Dale Brown embattled head coach of the Bayou Bengals. Uh, coach, a lot of people are saying right now that we are living through Crazy days at LSU Part 2. It seems like there's five or ten major things going on over there that I could point to and say, this is going on, that's going on. I would imagine if you were still coaching there, we would have interviewed you a lot over the last year or so about the pandemic, about racial tensions, about NCAA investigations involving both LSU football and Will Wade and the LSU basketball team, the treatment of women, uh, alleged sexual assault allegations, and the Hush Blackwell report. As a man who loves LSU and coached there for 25 years, is there anything you would like to share as an outsider looking in on LSU at the moment? I'm, I'm saddened by it and disheartened by it. The only comment I would make would be this, that um, number one, I am so, anybody, anybody that rapes or sexually molests somebody or does anything to a female, I've got a daughter, I've got a wife, um, I have, I have no, no, whatever, if that happens, now, are there false things that occur in life? Yes. But I'm really, really sensitive to that. And if somebody does that, if somebody would have come to me and told me somebody did that on that team, they'd be done. I don't care if they were the greatest player on the team. They would be done. They wouldn't play. Mm-hmm. So that would be the only thing. I, I don't know all the other details, and I don't want to know them. I know too, I know too much by just what I've read and seen, and now uh, you, you can't help it. Turn on your cell, you got it, you got it on your computer, people are calling. Um, but I think the truth, whatever is done in the darkness, is eventually exposed in the daylight. And I just hope things come out good, but it sure looks bad right now. Well, let's go back in time a little bit. So, obviously, Coach, you did not coach Pistol Pete Maravich, but you're coming to LSU fresh off that. And... 
Coach, one day I was in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, eating at a restaurant, and I didn't want people to know I was from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so, but, but a nice man who might have been in his 60s or 70s started talking to me, hey, what do you do for a living, blah, blah, blah. And I said, I work in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And this man, Coach, spoke to me for half an hour, 45 minutes about Pistol Pete Maravich, a guy from Alabama. He had gone to see Pistol Pete score, what, almost 70 points against Alabama. 69, that, wasn't it that yeah, night? I think, yeah, 69 and 69 or something like that. I had that huge game. And this guy talked to me about Pistol Pete forever. I'm just curious, you not coaching him, but coming onto campus at that time when they had this, you know, kind of global icon but didn't have the team success, what was it like when you came into that situation? First of all, we get to beat Pistol Pete. Uh, this is not embellished at all. He is the greatest offensive player in the history of the game. And never say never. No one. Now, when I say no one, there's an asterisk to that. Now there's a shot clock. Now there's a three-point line. There wasn't that during Pete's time. But the average 44.2 points a game and be the magician that he was with the ball and wound up really, really a nice man. I got to know him pretty well near the end of his life. And uh, when I inherited this job, I immediately wrote a letter to his father and him, and I don't know if they ever got him because I got no reply, but I told him I was sorry I had to inherit the job under these conditions, and they're always welcome. Well, they finally did come back, and I, I got to spend time, not intimate time, or trip with him or anything, but uh, a really, really d devout Christian at the end of his life and, and a good guy, but a great, great player. And uh, Sam King, a local writer, as you know, for 44 years, mm -hmm. took, they didn't have a lot of video, but he took the, the things they used to type up, you know, Maravich from 15, uh, uh, Apple Sanders layup, a so forth from 20 feet. He imposed off of that how much, uh, and, and that, that Pete didn't know there was a three, it wasn't a three point line. So he would have obviously shot more of them, but just the shots he took, I think Sam said it was about seven or nine more points he would have averaged. So he, he'd have averaged over 50 points a game. There's, there's never been anybody even close to him, I don't, I don't believe. Yeah. Just uh, just incredible, without a doubt. My parents were in college at the time. They wish they went to more games, for sure. <laughs> they still talk about that. Uh, Coach, 1980-81, I hear people on the radio talk about the greatest this, the greatest that. A lot of people I've heard speak about it. I was a little too young to really enjoy this team fully, but um, – that has been referred to as the greatest basketball team in LSU history. Uh, I go back and look at some of the WAFB archive tapes um, and uh, Celebrate by Cool and the Gang had just come out, that song, and it was just kind of perfect. You know, celebrate good times. You had people at the airport waiting for you. You had the PMAC packed. You won 31 games. Uh, you went 17-1 and in the SEC. Howard Carter, Rudy Macklin, Ethan Martin, Greg Cook. Um, your memories of that team in that year? Um. Very much like the very much like the Baylor team, they all liked one another. They hustled. Uh, they did things that nobody thought they could do. Uh, Thirty-one wins was uh, most in the country that year. Twenty-six straight wins. Uh, one game being short, short of a record that was never been broken. Eighteen straight um, wins in the SEC. Um, Rudy Macklin got hurt, and that messed us up for the Final Four. But a great team and an uncomplicated team and a fun group of guys. Very much reminds me an awful lot of the Baylor team. And they had good point guard leadership. Little old McKinley High School, Ethan Martin. He was he was a general on the floor, but a quiet guy. So you go to the Final Four in 81, and then your 85-86 team. Kind of a different story. Underdog, out of nowhere to an extent, an 11 seed in the tournament. Uh, I want. I wish I could jump in a time machine and be at the Pete Maravich Assembly Center for the first two rounds of this tournament when you beat Purdue in double overtime, right? And then, yes, sir. And then Memphis when it was what Anthony Wilson picks the ball up from his shoes and throws it yep, up and it, yep, go, yep, it goes yep, in. Yep, yep, Prob yep. Probably one of the more uh, iconic shots of you, both arms raised in the air, you're running a 100-yard dash into the tunnel off the floor. Um, the, those first two uh, games of the tournament that year. They were as spectacular as the next two. Uh, we had to go play, as you know, in Georgia Tech in their arena. They had three lottery picks on the team. Then we had to play, we beat them, and then we had to play Kentucky, which which was um, 
a powerhouse, and they'd beaten us three times during the year. So what that team did, first of all, this group of guys, we went through just about everything you could, the chicken box, suspension, ineligibility, uh, in, academic problems, and injury. They held on, and they just believed in the system, and I kept on telling them, just continue to believe. It's really a tough time. They're still, they, they, they were at that time. They became the lowest seed ever to go to a Final Four eleven, but they still hold a record that hasn't been broken. They're the only team in history that beat the number one, two, and three seed to get to the get to the Final Four. Yeah, Coach, when I was at the 2006 Final Four, when Coach Brady and, and LSU went to Indianapolis, uh, George Mason made it, but they were 11, just like you. And uh-huh. then LSU got referenced again 1986, uh, 20 years before. Coach, I was thinking about it. If I wanted to create an L- a basketball player in a lab to play today's game, meaning who can I get to maybe stick around for three or four years but then won't woo the pro scouts enough that they'll convince this guy to go pro, I think I would create Ricky Blanton, right? I mean, just a hardworking, um, blue-collar Put up points, put up rebounds, guy, uh, and and just didn't have a lot to say. wasn't a big talker, wasn't a mouthy guy, just a leader by example. And loved the clutch. The number of last second shots that he made, Georgetown, UNLV, and I can give a whole bunch of them. And then the idiot you're talking to, Dale Brown, <laughs> I said to Ron Abernathy when we first went to see him, Ron was really really high, and then I said to Ron. He's shaving and everything. And we're getting, I think we think we're going to go to Bland home that day. And I said, Ron, are you sure he can play in the NCAA? And Ron turned around and gave me the dirtiest look. And he said, that white boy can play, coach. <laughs> and he did. And he had great parents. He was a great leader. Not one complaint. He gave everything he had on the court. And when I had to move him to center... We had lost, uh, we lost Soren Jovanovic with a knee injury. I kicked Tito Horford off the team. Uh, Nikita Wilson was ineligible. Uh, yeah, everything was just falling apart. And I thought, well, what are we going to do? Who's going to play center? And I thought, Ricky Blanton. So I called him in the office. And I said, Ricky, I said, starting today in practice, you're going to be our center from here. And his eyes got big as saucers. Just how <laughs> the white. Coach, I never played. I never played with my back to the basket. Well, you got to learn, learn quickly. Never complain. Never mope. Never whine. I never. I will hurt my NBA career. He'll do this. He'll do that. No, he was ideal. Well, Coach um, Chris Jackson, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. For people of my age group that, like, were watching LSU basketball in the late 80s, this is like, um, you know, your favorite band when you were growing up, your favorite movie. It never gets old, right? It's like, if I got five minutes to spare, I'm going to type in YouTube, Chris Jackson, LSU, and I'm going to watch highlights of Chris Jackson. And do I romanticize and make him even better than what he was at the time? Probably, and I don't care. You know, he's just my favorite LSU athlete ever, and I, like you said about Pistol Pete, I, I didn't see Pistol Pete, I wasn't born yet, yep, but yep. Chris Jackson is my Pistol Pete, if that makes any sense, you know, and so. Uh, he uh, he was Steph Curry before Steph Curry was Steph Curry, and let me let me tell you what kind of child he was, a man he is now, but a young man he was when he came here, he uh, didn't know who his father was, absolute abject poverty, never asked for anything, never wanted anything, would go in that gym at night and shoot and shoot and shoot and shoot. And the first game he played at home, I don't remember who it was, and I believe he but I believe he got thirteen points. And so Ken Lowe came in so the media wants to have you bring uh, Chris Jackson to the media. Some of the questions I don't remember who asked and I don't know how the exact question, but it was something be Chris, are you are you are you real impressed with the fact that first game out, man, you got Couple digits here, you got 13 points there. How do you feel about that? Because well, I'm really happy, you know, coming into Division One. So when I walked back to the dressing room, I put my arm around him. I said, Don't ever do that again in a press conference. What did I do wrong? I said, Don't degrade yourself. I said, If you, you're so good, you're unselfish. I said, When you, when you can break away from the offense, because he had threat syndrome, which his head would twitch, and that would sometimes free him. The disadvantage was it was an advantage for, 
for him, for a guy that was guarding him, thinking he was going that way. I said, you just go ahead and you're so unselfish. Don't look over the bench if it's a poor shot. You think it's a poor shot. You can be you can be one of the great scorers in the country. I didn't say it was going to be the leading scorer. I wouldn't have idea he was going to do that. So that loosened him up. He knew he could he could still dish the ball. And he's very unselfish. If you look at his assist ratio, and he seldom turned the ball over. And never complained. Every time I see him, even today, I just want to put my hands my hands up on his cheek and tap him like a little child. He just He's a beautiful man and a great, great, great player. And it's a shame what happened to him in the NBA. They should go hide themselves in the closet for a week for doing that. You know, just on the positive notes with Chris, um, back before the Internet and everything was on your phone and whatnot, for him to be on the front cover of Sports Illustrated, he's a pistol. You know, I remember everyone just had to have that magazine. And um, we, we don't encourage drinking, Coach, but it was funny. I heard stories about the local bars. You know, if Chris Jackson scores over 40 tonight, you know, drinks are half price or free or whatever. You know, it was just yep, like yep, it was yep. a phenomenon. No, he, he 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 was a phenomenon, and he he could he could do everything. First of all, when he caught the ball, he wasn't just thinking of dribbling around like sometimes you see these guys dribble around with the ball. He either shot it, he penetrated and shot the little short jumper, or he kicked to somebody else when somebody tried to double team him. He could do it all, and he could his generations when he going he was just just a little tiny guy going to that basket, and the big guys trying to block his shot, he could just maneuver himself. Uh, he was he was truly a great player and never had one problem with him ever. Back before every game was on television or on your phone or whatever, I, I think really the coming out party was you played this ESPN game at Florida, and Bill Rafferty, uh, legendary broadcaster, everyone loves Bill. He was basically speechless by the end of the game as Chris scores Mahmoud. 53 points in his first SEC game in Gainesville. It was between the legs, spotting up. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, almost can't put it into words. To be honest with you, I caught myself being kind of a part spectator. Shocked. What, what's he going to do next? Because a lot of it was spontaneous. It wasn't off our offense. He could do things. He could spot something so simple, a little opening, he could spot it. And he wasn't a selfish player. He wasn't out to be the leading scorer and freshman in the history of the game. But he could score, and um, and he, he did it. And, and I agree with you, and I really do, and this, and this is not embellished. He was Steph Curry before Steph Curry was Steph Curry. And you said he wasn't selfish. I, I was going through his old clips the other day. The, the court's 90 feet, right? So there was this one play where he threw a one-handed pass that skipped once to Ricky Blanton, hit him in stride for a layup. It must have covered 70 feet of the floor. Um, he was a brilliant passer also. Everything he did was pretty was pretty brilliant. And I just want to say, Coach, I met him three or four years ago. He, he came to LSU as a speaker. He was speaking to a group of people on some hard-hitting issues. Uh, and I walked away from it saying, "This is a this guy's uh, much more intelligent than me." Local sports guy who just wants to talk about basketball games. This is a well-read guy. This is a sweet guy, like you talk about. I walked away not feeling threatened or, "Ooh, this guy's dangerous." Did I agree yep. with every? Did I agree with everything he said? Maybe, maybe not. But uh, who cares? You know, I was just like, you know what? I felt enlightened today. I learned something today from him. Your, your your questions had some depth. They weren't they weren't superficial today. They were they were fun to answer, and and some of them are complicated, like you know the mess at LSU. And I yeah I certainly hope it get cleared up and everything. January twenty eighth, nineteen eighty nine. Younger people, coach, they may not believe this. Okay, the fact that an LSU regular season basketball game sold 66,000 tickets, and 54,000 people show up at the Louisiana Superdome to see LSU play number two Georgetown. By the way, and then I, I, I kind of like tying, telling these old stories because it ties it into the present. We lost the great John Thompson, um, national champion, three Final Fours, uh, passed away, the legendary Georgetown coach, last August. Um, how did you agree? How did you get him to agree to come and play in front of all these LSU fans? That, that's one thing that kind of struck me. When I'm thinking about this game, I will I will give you that, but I'll answer how the game, what the idea was. We used to go recruit. Yeah. 
people would always throw in my well, this, this is primary football, and you know, you don't draw as much as Syracuse, you don't draw as much as Kentucky, you don't draw as... Well, they were naming arenas that were way bigger than ours. We were filling ours, but mm-hmm. it was only about 14, and some of those were 20, 25,000. So I kept on hearing that all the time, and I thought to myself, what could I do? I thought, hey, I called Doug Thornton, who ran the Superdome, and I said, give me some dates. I'd like to play a game down there the next three years, and I'd like to try to break a record. He said, you want to what? I said, I'd like to break the record. I'd like to be the largest crowd in the history of basketball. So when I go recruit, I don't have to make up something or get defensive about it. So I drove down there day after day after day and started to promote the game and uh, got a hold of John. Now, John was ready to come because I think he had two or three players from New Orleans on his team, and he, he recruited that area. It was good for him. It was going to be on national television. But what really put it over the, the top, I, it didn't look like we were going to be able to break the record. So I got a hold of uh, Coca-Cola and told them that, We'll give you some tickets way up on top. I forget how many we gave them offhand. And it'll have the regular price on there. But we'll sell them to you, and you can give six away for anybody who comes in and buys a six-pack or something. I think that helped promote it. Mm-hmm. And then um, we played uh, Notre Dame. We played Georgetown. We played uh, Texas. Yeah. I think we won all three of those games. But the Georgetown game was historical because they were, uh, they were number two, and I think – was it number two or number one? Uh, Do you remember? Number two in the country, Coach. Looked it up today. Yeah. Um, and uh, Wayne Sims, I love Wayne, uh, still in the Baton Rouge area, of course. I think he scored 20 points in the first half that day. And, of course, it came down to the last shot. Chris Jackson was triple teamed. Uh, Russell Grant, who's on Twitter, and we joke. A walk on from Kentucky. <laughs> Russell Who jokes about. the ball like heck. Yeah. Well, he shot an air ball, <laughs> and he jokes about it. He said, you know, it, it, it got it got uh, tipped. it got tipped, I think, by Alonzo Morning. He went out. Gotcha. Uh, tell, tell me who the two centers were for. Uh, well, Alonzo Morning, uh, Matumbo, he wasn't on that team, was he? Yes, he was. But yes. that was a heck of a game, and uh, I put Russell in at the end because he could really shoot the ball. I knew they would. You know, attack groups, they knew he was going to get the ball. Well, Russell was wide open, and somehow Morning left and just tapped the ball, and it fell short, and Wayne Sims couldn't get it. And I think he tapped it to Ricky, didn't he? He did. He tapped it to Ricky, who made the layup, the uh, legendary Brent Musburger, LSU wins it, LSU wins it. And uh, uh, an incredible moment, and 82-80, to 80, the final score. How do you, I used to have a VH tape of that game, Coach, and I used to watch it all the time. It was a, it was definitely a pick-me-up back in the day. I, I just uh, – uh, I remember I had a basketball game that day at Milton Elementary, and I couldn't hear the game. We went out to the, the car. We caught the very end on a scratchy radio, Jim Hawthorne's call, but somebody had recorded it for me, and I watched it. But uh, – um, see, that's that's back, Coach. That's how the game has changed, right? I mean, that that's a basketball game that had the emotional impact to me as a football game. You know, that doesn't yeah, happen. Sure any, you know, you know what I'm saying? Um, and the fact the players you're talking about, this is, and I don't, I guess this is going to start sounding like I'm getting old when I say, well, it's not the way it used to be, but. You know, you, you, the stars, you had so many stars. You know, the, the teams come in yep. now, it's like, okay, they're good players. They work hard. I'm not taking anything away yep. from them. Yep. But yep. you're, not, you're not getting Larry Johnson coming in, Coach. You're not getting, uh, you yep. know, uh, Christian Leitner. These guys aren't coming to the PMAC anymore or playing in the Superdome. So, Well, when we tried to play them all, if you know, if, if you'll go down and look at the top, the top teams in the country, we tried to schedule them home and home. And... Uh, North Carolina, Duke, I mean, UCLA, I, I, we had a deal set up with Indiana, and then I, I retired. We had a deal set up uh, after the, the following year, but I, I retired in 97. Coach, the 1989-1990 LSU team, I could maybe put them on the on the same court as the 1980-81 LSU team, right? And they might split 10 games. You've got Chris Jackson, you've got the Twin Towers, Shaquille O'Neal, Stanley Roberts, Vernell Singleton, Wayne Sims, uh, Maurice Williamson, uh, Harold Boudreaux, who I think was the player of the year in Louisiana. I mean, he's getting a little playing time, but not much. Um, you, that team lost in the second round to a Georgia Tech team who was also loaded. Um, but when you look back on that team and the, and the, and the talent on that team, 
Um, you, you certainly had moments where you were like the best team in the country. You beat UNLV at home when they had Larry Johnson and all those guys. But so, so within a week time, coach, in January 28, 1990, you beat UNLV at the PMAC, who's number five. And then five days later, you played the Loyola Marymount game. Uh, those two games within a week stretch. Wow. That was, uh, that was something to see. That team was an interesting team. It, um, they only played one year together, you know, and, mm-hmm. Had they played longer, they would have been better. And I don't think I did my best job with that team. They weren't the underdog. They were kind of the dog, but they were two freshmen and a sophomore. And so the the youth of the team, and then I, I don't believe I, I go back and I, I maybe, oh, hindsight's always twenty twenty. I probably shouldn't have used a double post either around that time. That team could have been better, even though they were young. Had they stayed together, they would have been dominant. But they only played one year together. Uh, we we didn't have a we did. They were all they were all hesitant in being lead. Now, had Shaquille been older, mm-hmm. I think he would have been a good leader. But that was his first year at the uh, helm, too. You know. Yeah, and he was growing into his body. He was a little clumsy. He, he, he sure was. He, he was not, you know, obviously what he became, but it was uh, to your point there. So so what do you remember about – so I looked up the box score today, Coach, for the, the 1990 LSU Loyola Marymount game. They shot the ball 112 times that day. Uh, you, sh- you shot the ball 95 times that day. Um, I don't want to say the most famous game in LSU basketball history, but I feel like every go down. I've, I've had people tell me all over the country that they saw that game. Um, I think the, um, the odd thing about it, I knew how good they were. I think they were averaging 127 points, weren't they? Or something like that. Uh, just un- incredible numbers. Yes. And so I, I had to make a decision. I thought, we can't run with him. I mean, we got these two big guys, and Stanley, you know, he's not that quick in the first place, and he wasn't at that time in good shape. And so I thought, Stanley's the key. So several days before practice, I'd be in the middle of the court and look at my watch, and I'd say, it's uh, 1 o'clock out in Los Angeles right now, and we're getting ready to practice here at 3. In a couple hours, Paul Westhead's going to come on the court. And he's going to tell his team, well, we're going to play LSU next week. And if Dale Brown is a stupid to think he can run with us, with those big guys, especially Stanley Roberts, and I looked Stanley in the eye, <laughs> because he was so sweet. He just, just he want to hug him all the time. Well, he took that serious. He wound up making 10 out of 10 from the field. And I'm not sure if he even missed a free throw. But that stimulated him because I, that was a decision. We didn't know how to hold the ball. We, that wasn't the team we were. We liked to run and fast break and et cetera and get good quick shots, hurry offense. But Stanley, I believe, uh, Stanley I Roberts. Believe it was 10 out of 10, wasn't he? Uh, I got the box score that cut off here, but I do know that Stanley had 21 points, 12 rebounds. Shaq had 20 points, 24 rebounds, 12 block shots. Uh, Chris, wow. Chris Jackson, 34 wow. points. Uh, Vernell Singleton, 22 points, 8 rebounds. Wayne Sims, uh, 19 points. A lot of people have to score to get to 148. <laughs> so that's what uh, that's what happened. As a legendary kind of story with WAFB, uh, Duke, Christian Leitner, and those guys come to the PMAC February the 8th of 1992. The students were lining up outside the PMAC like a day before. Um, I'll tell you this story real quick. Uh, there was a, a contest that uh, if anybody in the line, the student line, could spell Shishesky correctly, they would get... Oh, I, I can't spell it right now. Don't ask. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> they would get free pizza. So they go down the line, and, you know, it takes a while, but finally some kid, you know, K-R-Y-Z, blah, blah, blah. okay, that's correct. You got it. You get free pizza. So... The game takes place, and the next day, Mike Krzyzewski does his post-game press conference. He's leaving the podium. He's walking out of the room, and then suddenly he turns to Steve Schneider and says, hey, by the way, that kid on TV last night, he didn't spell my name right, and walks away. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you never know who's watching, Coach. That's the, uh, that's the story. But what do you remember about Duke coming in? You did not win the game, but certainly it was one of the more legendary uh, games and atmospheres in the PMAC. You had the – the noise stick going at the time, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we did. You're correct. You couldn't be a politician because you've got too many facts. <laughs> um, 
And Shaq that day against Christian Leitner, I know he had been embarrassed the, the year before when you went to Cameron Indoor, but yeah. uh, that, that day he stood up to Leitner, 25 points, 12 rebounds, 7 block shots. You were 1 of 10 on free throws in the last 6 minutes. Ugh. Uh, just make a few more of those. But, uh, but Shaq, uh, Shaq proved himself that day uh, in that, that head-to-head. That was a big part of the yeah. Christian Leitner documentary. I don't know if you saw it on ESPN. But yeah, that, yeah. And I think I think fans are are more your fans are going to get more stimulated. You know. Let me ask you this, Coach. This is a fascinating topic and one I, I like to kind of maybe uh, hit the stretch with. Uh, John Brady. I have interviewed John Brady several times in the last um, few years, and I think most people have said that John Brady has changed exponentially from the guy who arrived at LSU in 1997 and. He has told me that the two of you have agreed that we should have done a better job with our relationship. When I first came here, I was a 42-year-old coach from Sanford. Coach Brown was still here. He was a legend. I was insecure about that. I pushed back on him. He pushed back on me. We didn't handle it the right way. Um, I, I think that it's my personal opinion that towards the stretch run of John Brady's career at LSU, he did change a lot, but I think um, maybe it was too late in some regards. But just uh, speak to me about John Brady and the two of you guys uh, over the years and where it stands now. Um, I didn't particularly like John when he was coaching here. Um, he never did anything personally to me, but I didn't like his style, so to speak. And I wasn't out in the street or calling you or anybody else, but I didn't really like mm-hmm. some of some of his methods. And then he was rather indifferent in, uh, towards me, too. So it wasn't a very warm situation, but we have become, lo and behold, we have become, I consider him really a good friend right now. And I think what he's done, he uh, he just looked and said we we were right. No, it it, it takes two people to be wrong. Um, I should have probably embraced you more instead of being, I never tried to ever hurt him. I never talked behind his back or anything, but I just didn't really like his techniques. But what he's done and the things I've seen him do to apologize to players and the guy he is now, we're, we're personal friends. I like John Brady. That's great. And like, like it's always a learning experience, boy. And you know. Well, Coach, um, this has been a pleasure for me. Uh, I want to thank you, Daddy Dale Brown. Thank you for Chris Jackson and Ricky Blanton and Shaquille O'Neal and Clarence Caesar. Hail Caesar and the Death Dome, and all the great memories that uh, you gave me and uh, countless LSU basketball fans over the years. Uh, we uh, we love those years. We cherish those years. God bless you. You sound the same you did 30 years ago. I uh, hope, you, hope you're around for another 30 at least, and uh, you're a treasure to LSU and Baton Rouge. We appreciate you. Well, very much. you're very kind. Thanks a lot, Chuck. I enjoyed, the, enjoyed being on with you.